Greetings, fellow curious minds. Today, we embark on a mind-bending journey through the cosmos as we explore one of the most tantalizing questions of all time. Is time travel possible in our universe? Buckle up, because we're about to dive into the realm of theoretical physics and uncover the secrets that may unravel the fabric of time itself. It's a cold, moonless night with a mist that hangs heavy in the air. As you turn to cross the road, fog swallows both the sound and headlights of the oncoming car. You see it too late and brace yourself for impact. Then out of nowhere, an elderly stranger shoves you out of harm's way, is hit by the car, and ends up in a heap on the tarmac. Their life ends as yours is saved. Later, a police officer hands you an envelope found in the pocket of the deceased. It is addressed to you. You open this envelope and find a note with two words scribbled on it. It simply reads, study physics. Whoever wrote this note saved your life at the expense of theirs, so it only seems fair you follow their advice. Decades later, you become a much celebrated physics professor, your specialist subject, Albert Einstein's theories of relativity. You've always had a hunch that time travel is possible, and one day, finally, you crack it, and the world's very first time machine is set, buzzing before you. Only then does the penny drop. How had you never realized before? You now have the power to go anywhere and any when, but you know exactly what you have to do. You take the letter you've kept all these years out of its frame on the wall, place it back inside its original envelope, and put the envelope in your pocket. Stepping into your time machine, you set the controls to take you back to a cold, moonless, misty night, arriving just in time to push your younger self out of the path of the onrushing car you die on the roadside. It seems simple enough, but the real joy of time travel stories like this one comes once you begin to scratch beneath the surface and some incredibly profound questions begin to emerge. First of all, who wrote the letter? The older version of you simply takes the letter they'd already been given as a teenager back in time. The letter is a seemingly creatorless entity stuck in a time loop. This is the bootstrap paradox, Secondly, do these time loops keep on repeating? You save your teenage self so they grow up to travel back in time to save their teenage self who grows up to travel back in time and so on. You are stuck in a relentless cycle of living and dying. But the letter isn't. Does it just keep getting older and more worn and tattered? This is the restoration paradox. And whose idea was it to study physics anyway? The notion seems to appear out of nowhere, a thought with no origin. This is the ex nihilo paradox. And if events like this can actually happen, then it also appears you have no free will, no choices in life. You are always going to invent the time machine and had absolutely no option to do otherwise. It had to happen, had always happened. If you don't invent a time machine, then you can't save your teenage self and you yourself would therefore die as a teenager. There is something in your future that's firmly fixed. This is the predestination paradox. And finally, what if you change your mind? Unfortunately for your older self, this is not an option. You can't get cold feet when you arrive and let the younger you get hit by the car. How could you be there to have second thoughts in the first place? This is the auto-infanticide paradox. It is impossible to kill a younger version of you, even though the act of not doing something. And so, not quite such a simple story. Welcome to the weird and wonderful world of time travel. But of course, traveling freely through time is impossible, you might say. You can't simply visit yesterday or rush headlong through millennia. And yet, this too is not quite so straightforward. Despite its myriad impracticalities, there are slivers of possibility lurking at the lying just out of reach. And so, the question arises. If time travel were to be possible, just how could we do it? In 2021, a researcher at Portsmouth University calculated there are about 6 times 10 to the power of 80 bits of information in the observable universe. That's a 6 followed by 80 zeros. The sun beats down as the distinctive whooping barks of howler monkeys echo around the humid swamps. The current in the muddy, winding river is so strong that you don't even have to paddle through your canoe. You just sit back and take in the sights and sounds as you're carried along. Jack Finney, 
arguably one of the finest proponents of time travel fiction, compared our experience of time to a river like this one. It seems like we're relentlessly ferried downstream from the past to the future. We have no need to propel ourselves, but slowing down, speeding up, or turning around and heading back upstream doesn't seem possible either. But what happens to the parts of the river that we've left behind? Or in other words, where does yesterday go? It certainly seems as if it just disappears. Yet making the same argument about an actual river would seem ludicrous. You're unlikely to accept that the riverbed is torn up and mysteriously vanishes just because you've disappeared around the next bend. The upstream parts of the river are still there, even if you aren't. In the same way, it seems as if tomorrow isn't real until it is, that somehow it magically appears once the curtain falls on today. But that would be like new water springing up to make the river of time longer only once you approach. Where would it come from? And so, over the years, scientists have revealed that time really is like that river, with its length already laid out in its entirety, from its source high in the foothills of the Big Bang to its estuary at the universe's eventual demise, the past, present, and future existing alongside one another. Your great-great-great-grandchildren every bit as real as you are now, your great-great-great-grandparents still alive and well, frolicking in the swells upstream in the vast river of time. Philosophers know this idea as eternalism. It's the opposite of presentism, which argues that only now exists and that the past is gone and the future yet to emerge. Debates between eternalist and presentist philosophers have raged since the days of ancient Greece. Indeed, the 4th century philosopher St. Augustine compared the present to a knife's edge, straddling the perceived past and an imagined future. But to a physicist, eternalism is known as the block universe theory and is based on Albert Einstein's much-lauded general relativity, one of the most successful theories in the history of science. In 1905, Einstein publishes The Special Theory of Relativity, it does away with Isaac Newton's notion of absolute time. There is no universal clock that everyone can use to agree on when something happens. Instead, as the name suggests, time is relative. Depending on how they move through space, one observer could see event A happen before event B, while another sees event B occur before event A. Both observers are equally correct, and event in your past could be in someone else's future. This is yet another reason why all our yesterdays cannot simply vanish. How can they, when the events they contain might form part of somebody else's tomorrows? As well as this, special relativity cemented the fact that space and time are not completely distinct from one another. In 1908, Hermann Minkowski develops Einstein's work and properly unites space and time once and for all. He says that moving through space affects how you measure time, because the three dimensions of space and one of time are actually woven together into a single fabric that he called space-time. But how do we know that space and time are actually bundled up together into the space-time that the Bloch universe is made of? Proof would eventually come in tests of Einstein's general theory of relativity, which he presented to the world in 1915. Back in the 1840s, astronomers had harnessed Newtonian gravity to discover an entirely new planet. Using Newton's equations to predict the future path of Uranus, they had found that it appeared to deviate from that path. The French astronomer Urbain Le Verrier pulled over the equations for months, searching for an answer. Was Newtonian gravity wrong after all? Not quite. Le Verrier suggested that an unseen, more distant planet pulls on Uranus and affects its orbit. If correct, Newton's laws of gravity would be vindicated, and in 1846, Neptune was found. Despite this success, and although he didn't know it yet, Le Verrier was about to hammer the first nail into Newtonian gravity's coffin. Planets don't have circular orbits, but slightly changing elliptical ones, with the sun offset from the center. Newtonian physics claimed that these slightly changing orbits was due to the gravitational pull of the other planets. And Newton's equations were correct in their predictions for all of them, except one, Mercury. Le Verrier realized this in 1859, and the search began for another new planet, 
but no such was ever found. Instead, the answer came from Einstein. On the 18th of November, 1915, he wrote a letter to the German mathematician, David Hilbert. Today, I am presenting a paper in which I derive out of general relativity the perihelion motion of Mercury, discovered by Leverrier. No gravitation theory had achieved this until now. Imagine the fabric of space-time as the surface of a trampoline. If you place something heavy in the center, it will sag in the middle. Likewise, the presence of a massive object like the sun creates a dip in the fabric of space-time. Physicists call this a gravity well. Einstein was arguing that there is no Newtonian gravitational pull at all. It is merely a mirage. As the innermost planet, Mercury moves more deeply into the sun's gravity well than its neighbors. The deeper it goes, the more the local space-time becomes curved, and it is this increased curvature that causes Mercury's orbit to change. For all the other planets, the curvature is subtle enough that Newtonian gravity gives the same answer. Only in the extreme gravitational environment that Mercury inhabits does Newtonian gravity show itself for what it really is. A good approximation. Gravity is not a pull. It is the result of curved space-time. Since then, astronomers have tested this idea in myriad ways, from solar eclipses to swirling black holes and rippling gravitational waves. And in every experiment, space-time passes with flying colors. Our entire cosmos of past, present, and future, merely a four-dimensional block of malleable space-time that just sits there. A supernatural being that could somehow look upon it from the outside world would clearly see yesterday, today, and tomorrow happily coexisting. But where did this all come from? As with everything else, scientists believe that the Big Bang birthed all of space-time. In other words, all of space and all of time. The regions of time we refer to as the past, the present, and the future are all there together in their entirety. And so, it is as easy for two people to exist then and now as they do here and there. They can be separated by centuries of time, just as they can be separated by kilometers of distance. Any object within this block universe can be given four coordinates, three spatial to say exactly where it is, and one temporal to say exactly when it is. Imagine that an object's location in the block is marked by a dot. Even the dot of a physically stationary object moves because its time coordinate is constantly changing as second ticks after second, and today relentlessly becomes tomorrow. Join all the dots belonging to one particle, and you have a line that maps out its path through the block universe, a world lines. You are nothing but a collection of particle world lines woven together, a knot in space-time shedding and absorbing new world lines as you move towards the day, the knot that is you and does itself or is undone. All the actions you will ever take, from what you'll have for breakfast every day to if and who you'll marry and the houses and jobs you'll flip between are all entirely mapped out. You can't deviate from your journey any more than a train can deviate from its tracks. In this way, the block universe is like a book. The beginning, the middle, and the end are already written and unchangeable. Every choice you think you're making is actually pre-written, and so one that you were always going to make. A character caught in a love triangle on page 150 may be unaware that it gets resolved 50 pages later, but resolved it will be, and in the way it was always going to be. And this is why our time traveler from the opening story had to invent the time machine. An older version of them had already indelibly appeared on an earlier page. Their world lines eventually looped back round to intersect with themselves at a previous point. But can this really happen? Can you travel to the seemingly long distant past or indeed the far-flung future? If over then is no different to over there, it seems that the door to time travel is well and truly open. In a distant corner of the universe, a gargantuan supermassive black hole is holding sway over an entire galaxy. Its intense gravity is pulling, stretching, and ripping up whole solar systems. Hot gas and dust whirl around it as its huge magnetic field spins up and spits out shrapnel into the void. Among this debris is a tiny subatomic bullet, 
a proton, which races across the cosmos as close to the speed of light as it's practically possible to get. It has 100 quintillion times more energy than an ordinary particle of light, and after traveling over a billion light years, it slams into Earth's atmosphere with 21 million times the energy of collisions inside the famed Large Hadron Collider at CERN. It is so energetic that to this day, astronomers know it as the Oh My God particle. An example of an ultra-high energy cosmic ray, it is a reminder that the Earth sits in a celestial shooting gallery. And when rays like this one strike our atmosphere, the impact is so violent that it bursts into invisible fireworks display of subatomic particles. Peons, muons, and neutrinos erupt and cascade down to the ground. In fact, cosmic rays are so plentiful that they give you an annual dose of radiation, equivalent to three chest X-rays. And for one Italian physicist, cosmic rays became an obsession. His groundbreaking work on the muons, created by cosmic rays producing some of the first evidence that time travel to the future is not only possible, but commonplace. And his name was Bruno Rossi. Rossi is behind the wheel of an old bus, snaking along the highest road in the world where pine trees compete with snow-capped mountains to reach the sky. Eventually, he arrives at the place he's driven over a thousand miles from Chicago to reach Echo Lake. Nestled high up in the Mount Evans wilderness of Colorado, part of the world-famous Rocky Mountains, it sits almost 2,300 meters above sea level. Up in the mountains, Rossi is measuring the muons created by cosmic rays. Muons are unstable particles, and so they quickly break down or decay. Physicists call the time it takes for half of a group of muons to make this change their half-life. It is just 1.56 millionths of a second, but Rossi's measurements reveal something curious. Far more muons are reaching the ground than there should be. Even though the muons are traveling at more than 98% of the speed of light, over 15 half-lives should still elapse by the time they make it down to Echo Lake. With each successive half-life removing 50% of the remaining muon population, just 0.1% should reach Rossi. And so how come he is able to detect significantly more than that? The remarkable answer was that the muons were time-traveling into our future. Einstein's special theory of relativity says that you can think of anything moving through space-time as having a budget equal to the speed of light. The more of that budget you spend on moving fast through space, the less you spend on time. As the muons are traveling at close to the speed of light, considerably less time passes for them than for Rossi. From their perspective, fewer half-lives have elapsed, and so there simply hasn't been enough time for 99.9% .9 of them to decay. This effect is called relativistic time dilation, and when Rossi factored it in, exactly the right number of muons reached the ground. But you may ask, does this really count as time travel? Imagine instead that you are the muon, but instead of traveling from the upper atmosphere to Echo Lake, you travel on a big loop around the universe at the same 98% of the speed of light and return home 25 years older. Those of us left on Earth will have been spending less of our space-time budget on speed than you, and so it will cost us more in time. But to us, you have spent your budget differently, foregoing time to travel through space. 25 years may have passed for you while you were gone, but 125 have elapsed on Earth. You have skipped forward a whole century. Indeed, such a journey could mess with the normal generational order of family relationships, as is poignantly explored in the short story Memories of My Mother by Ken Liu. And so, time travel to the future is more than possible. We just have to accelerate humans to close to light speed. That is far from straightforward, however, because the faster you travel, the more energy you have. Einstein's famous equation E equals Missy squared tells us that energy and mass are interchangeable. So if you gain energy, you also gain mass. In other words, the faster you travel, the heavier you get to an outside observer. A person traveling at 99.99% .99 of the speed of light would weigh almost two tons, or about the same as a rhino, and accelerating them to that speed would require as much energy as everyone on Earth currently uses in three months. The mysteries surrounding time travel are mind-boggling, and they don't end here. 
From the concept of closed time like curves to the possible existence of parallel universes, time travel continues to push the boundaries of human understanding. As of now, time travel remains a captivating idea of science fiction, but that doesn't dampen the thrill of exploring the possibilities and imagining what the future might hold. Who knows what discoveries await us on our quest to unravel the secrets of time? Thank you for joining us on this epic journey through the cosmos. If you enjoyed this adventure, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more captivating explorations of the universe. Until next time, keep dreaming, keep questioning, and keep exploring the wonders of our extraordinary universe.